Hello, everybody, um, and welcome to today's webinar. We are very pleased to be with you for this webinar, and this is the last of our regular series before the summer break. My name is Fiona Hanley, and I'm the Quebec uh, co-representative of Kane. Um, we uh, invite you to put your name and location in the chat if you would like to do so, and also invite you to um, ask any, have any questions that you might have or make comments to also put them in the chat. Um, this uh, webinar is presented by the Canadian Association of Nurses for the Environment. Uh, the Canadian Association of Nurses for the Environment, or CANE, is a national all-volunteer organization founded in 2008, and its mission is to promote planetary health amongst nurses and people in Canada and around the world. And we do this by engaging in advocacy, education, research, practice and policy at all levels of nursing and society. And uh, I acknowledge and am grateful for living on the unceded traditional territory of the Kanyankahaga. This land, uh, also known as Montreal, has also long served as a gathering place for Abenaki, Anishinaabe and other nations. I'd like now to present today's session, Eco-Anxiety and Emotions, Turning Reaction into Action. And uh, the plan for today's presentation is that we are very lucky to have uh, three speakers today who will each present for about 10 minutes, and then we will have a uh, Q&A session at the end. So our first uh, speaker today uh, is uh, Emily Tremblay, who has been a nurse for four years and is pursuing graduate studies in nursing at the University of Ottawa. As a PhD candidate, her research interests focus on the involvement of the healthcare system in climate change, environmental degradation, and its impact on the health of the Canadian population. Emily's presentation will consist of an overview of three environmental distress concepts, eco-anxiety, ecological grief, and nostalgia. And her focus will be on distinguishing the differences between these concepts, as well as their various similarities. Our next speaker is Haley Brophy, who is a registered nurse um, who has worked primarily in mental health and addictions and recently completed a Master of Nursing degree at the University of Alberta with a community focus. Haley has a personal and professional interest in climate justice principles with built-in health equity and hopes to be involved in research, policy and advocacy work in this area in the future. And uh, Haley will present the results of an integrated literature review on eco-anxiety in youth and young people and discuss the role of nurses in identifying and addressing the issue. And our third speaker is uh, Nikki Moeni, who is a policy analyst, uh, coal mining effluent regulations, uh, ECCCC organizer and youth climate, um, uh, youth organizer with Youth Climate Save Canada. Nika is the founder of the Canadian chapter of Youth Climate Save, an organization recognizing the link between animal agriculture and climate change and engaging youth in activism for climate change. And in this role, she has hosted more than 20 town halls with MPs and has also hosted a vegan Valentine's market with over 500 attendees in Toronto in early 2020. Nikki is the youth ambassador for Canada with the plant-based treaty a global campaign to transition to sustainable food systems. So I'm going to uh, turn it over to, um, to Emily. And uh, Emily, you could share your slides. Okay. Great, thank you. Hi everyone, I just want to say thank you for joining today and welcome to my presentation. Uh, so today I'll be starting to speak on various concepts and the world cloud of vocabulary that people use to describe the climate crisis, urgency or environmental issues. Uh, but most importantly, I will be focusing on eco-anxiety, ecological grief and solosalgia. And like I said, these three concepts describe an emotional experience that are related to environmental changes, uh, but they also describe the mental and emotional consequences, which are um, driven by the awareness of that slow and 
progressive degradation on the environment. Here, it really acknowledges that long-term and chronic issue and not only the acute and short-term. And the reason to really dive into these concepts today is to get that clarity. A lot of the times it's a little confusing, so it's really important to have these discussions, which we'll do today. So just so you know, I will briefly introduce each of the concepts separately, and then I'll really get into focusing on their um, differences as well as their various similarities. So first to get into what is eco-anxiety, which is the most recognizable term. Uh, briefly said, it's uh, anxiety in relation to the climate change and any issues uh, in the environment that are derived from climate change. It's that feeling of unease, uh, and a lot of uh, uncertainty towards the future uh, perception of negative impacts. It can also be triggered by that anticipation of uh, loss of ways of life or of species. Um, it's not only anxiety, but also symptoms such as grief that people might be feeling, fear, anger, and guilt. And why it's so important to talk about it today is a survey done by the Worth Global Style Network in 2019 found that 90% of its respondents who were aged 18 to 25 years old uh, were uncertain about the future due to climate change. And similar results were also found uh, by a study done uh, by UNICEF in 2013, where 75% of 11 to 16 year olds uh, reported being worried about their future uh, with that uncertainty and also um, worry about what the government is doing and reporting that it's not enough. So you can see that it's not your older uh, youth and even young adults, it's also that uh, younger age demographic, which is your 11 to 16 year olds. Um, the second uh, concept today, uh, it's that ecological grief. So it's a type of grief that's felt uh, in response to either an experience or that an, an anticipated loss. Uh, from the natural world due to acute or chronic uh, environmental changes. And those losses can be one of the following, which is the uh, losses in ecosystems, ways of life, species, or environmental knowledge. It's said that uh, ecological grief impacts more people who have close relationships to the environment, whether that be through work, uh, through uh, personal preferences or uh, cultural values, uh, but however, it can be universal. And the last concept to get into is solastalgia, and that one's a distress that's produced by environmental change impacting people directly in their homes or a place that they call home or feel a sense of home. And it's a direct experience, um, such as the ecological grief. Um, and what happens here is people are unable to de uh, derive solace or comfort from their homes like they once were. And you might be saying, hmm, solastalgia sounds like a concept or a word that I already know. And it's very similar to that concept. It's the other one is nostalgia. And as you know, nostalgia is that sentiment, feeling, or a wistful affection for the past. And typically it's uh, for a, a period or a place and where people derive happy personal associations. So nostalgia is the same in the sense of they can't derive those happy personal associations anymore because there's a change in their environment, but they're still at home. They haven't been displaced. To get into a little bit of their differences and similarities. So at the top, you can see each three of the concepts and the way I'm gonna uh, differentiate and show their similarities is through their triggering conditions, the phenomena at play and their conceptual foundations. So to dig in and to dive in, uh, eco-anxiety is a little bit more broad than eco-grief uh, and solastalgia. It's basically any threats uh, made by climate change and climate change alone no more specifics are mentioned. Um, whereas you see an ecological grief and solastalgia, it can be climate change that's a triggering uh, condition. However, it's also uh, destructive environmental practices such as mining and uh, extraction of oil or pollution that can also cause um, these feelings. Uh, but also these practices uh, in turn worsen climate change. Uh, all of these uh, three concepts are future oriented, but again, uh, eco-anxiety is still a lot more broad. It's just future oriented in general, whereas eco-grief and solastalgia are really focused on the loss of place, land, culture, and species. All of these, uh, what's phenomena taking out place is everybody uh, who has an association to these concepts, they're all feeling helplessness, hopelessness, and powerlessness. Um, but the terms differentiating each of them is anxiety for eco-anxiety, grief for eco ecological grief, and distress for solastalgia. 
But again, they're very interchangeable in the sense that they can all have uh, these different feelings and symptoms. It's just the um, ones that label them specifically are these. Um, again, eco-anxiety, it's an emotional reaction before its occurrence, but with eco-grief and solastalgia, usually it's a direct experience or something that's already happened and isn't just in the future. And what really differentiates the ecological grief and solastalgia from eco-anxiety is that there's really this loss of identity and sense of place because it's very grounded in its connectedness to nature and that place attachment. Whereas with eco-anxiety, it's more focused on adaptation and it's a problematic uncertainty. I tend to critique a little bit uh, eco-anxiety uh, because it's focused a lot more on adaptation, which is great because to tackle the climate crisis, we need to focus on adaptation, but we also need to focus on mitigation. So I just tend to critique a little, a little bit because it's lacking a little in the sense of focusing on that mitigation, which is needed. Um, to have good response to the present. Um, here's a little bit of a photo if you guys like some imagery to understand a little bit more the differences between the three. And just to conclude, uh, when I think of youth, uh, I'd like you guys to think of intergenera intergenerational justice as well. And what that is, is basically saying that each generation is a trustee of natural resources or of resources and our duty of the present generation to the younger ones and the future ones is to ensure healthy planetary conditions for a safe and sustainable future. And this concept of environmental, uh, sorry, intergenerational justice, it becomes important in the concept of climate justice because uh, it, with climate change, there's significant risks to health, food security, housing, and the ecosystems, which will impact younger generations way more than older generations. I'm not sure if everybody's aware, but it can take 20 to 30 years for carbon emissions to have a full effect on the environment uh, before it becomes apparent. So practices being done now will have a bigger burden on the people in the future. And that's why in my opinion, climate change is a social justice issue that's double layered. Not only is it uh, giving a bigger burden to future generations, but right now, the people and the countries who are contributing the most of it, uh, that being emitting the most carbon, having the most um, like uh, degradative uh, practices on the environment, uh, aren't the ones being uh, feeling those impacts the most. So um, the relationships of inequality uh, extend substantially beyond the present. And the failure of the government to act to prevent temperatures from rising, in my opinion, is an act of domination because a denial of people's rights to safety and adequate resources for survival is not right. And this is important because as nurses, our uh, duty in environmental activism touches on that social justice in terms of wealth distribution, opportunities and privileges within a society. As we know, this impacts our health, whether physical or mental, and that's why nurses have a big role to play. Thank you. Thank you for that, Emily. So, uh, hey everybody, my name is Haley. I'm gonna take over here. I'm just gonna share my screen really quick. Okay, can everybody see that? Fiona, can you give me a thumbs up? Yeah, excellent. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so um, as I as uh, Fiona said, uh, I'm an RN working in primarily in mental health and addictions, and I just completed my master's in nursing. Um, and I'm going to discuss my literature review that I did on uh, eco anxiety and young people. If you guys would like to read the entire document, uh, please email me, and I'm happy to send a copy along. Okay, so uh, eco anxiety in in youth. So youth and young people are chronologically more exposed to the effects of climate change and have an increased awareness of it in our connected and information rich world. As they grow up in the milieu of doom messages and recognize the difficult position that they and future generations are in this becomes a developmentally challenging stressor. So eco-anxiety uh, sounds really obvious on its face. Uh, so it evokes images of fear, concern, or worry, specifically in relation to ecological issues. This phenomenon has certainly garnered a lot of attention in the news in recent years, and then as well as in literature. It started to really um, 
become apparent in uh, in the literature as well. Uh, eco anxiety itself may manifest as a range of symptoms, uh, emotions, reactions, and coping mechanisms. Reviews undertaken of the literature generally describe eco anxiety as a non pathological response to the threat of climate change and ecological crisis. Biomedical views tend to imply that anxiety is generally maladaptive or not appropriate, but it is widely agreed that pathologizing eco-anxiety reframes the problem as an individual psychological issue rather than a global and real threat. Uh, in the review, um, very few authors acknowledge that this anxiety can exacerbate pre-existing anxiety, however, uh, or result in anxiety that requires intervention. Some authors actually posit that eco-anxiety itself, the term, uh, should be reserved for levels of clinical anxiety in relation to ecological crises or climate change, with distress or worry describing expected, understandable negative emotions that arise, uh, while others argue for a wide definition that encompasses a range of experience for youth. So all of this to say that um, eco-anxiety definitions are still being kind of debated. Eco-anxiety is also in the early stages of measurement. Uh, there are two kind of primary scales developed to measure uh, climate anxiety, but they've only been tested on adult populations, which as you can imagine is a problem uh, when we talk about youth and young people. They have yet to be validated as well, but generally uh, these scales measure levels of distress, functional impairment, and rumination on eco-related issues, similar to clinical anxiety scales. Complicating factors in measuring, measuring and delineating eco-anxiety in youth include context. So generally, uh, eco-anxiety has actually been defined and studied in the wealthy global North nations uh, that have less direct climate change exposure or have more protective factors. One exception uh, was one of the studies that was included in my review. Um, it was out of the Philippines and it uh, was conducted a few years after a hurricane. And interestingly here, <clears throat> there was lots of eco-anxiety found in Gen Z participants, but a lot less climate change awareness. So I would argue that actually the trauma effects of a large impact climate change event should be differentiated from anxiety resulting from global awareness of climate issues, and they require different responses. Um, but this still needs to be investigated. It's still pretty early in this uh, topic. So some of the conclusions um, that I drew from this literature review, uh, youth are definitely worried about climate change or are experiencing eco-anxiety. Um, in this, in one primary source, so one big literature review, uh, this correlated with, a de with decreased mental health overall. Uh, this anxiety is not something that can be overcome individually or quickly through traditional anxiety treatments like CBT, uh, reframing the threat, etc. And authors are also concerned about how eco-anxiety affects engagement. So we need youth to be engaged as the future leaders of the world. However, this places a significant burden on them, perhaps before they are developmentally ready. Many young people are worried uh, also, but do not have more sustainable lifestyles, according to uh, one of the primary researchers on eco-anxiety and youth. Um, this is kind of an interesting observation, uh, but again, more research is needed to substantiate it, as many others say that eco-anxiety is a motivating force for climate change action. If there is disparity in lifestyles and worry about climate change, this may be due to feelings of hopelessness uh, or their role and influence on the lifestyle in their families. Hopelessness was a big theme throughout the literature review. Um, so many youth actually feel that it's too late, uh, that the earth is doomed, humans can't make a large impact. Obviously, this is not an ideal coping strategy because youth do need to be involved in climate action, advocacy, and education. But first, they have to know and believe that there is hope and know that they're not solely responsible and that their anxiety um, can be managed, and it does have to be managed. So we cannot fix this without collective action and the, at the uh, root of the problem, but this does not mean that we do not address the psychological implications. So we are our mind and nurses, especially, we have a duty to the youth and young people to reduce their suffering and distress through various mechanisms and levels of influence. We as healthcare providers cannot dismiss these concerns uh, should they be brought up. Youth are unfortunately very used to being dismissed for their climate concerns, perhaps because climate issues, they make adults nervous too. Um, a key step is validation that their fears are rooted in reality. We also need to ensure that it is not framed as individual responsibility, but that individual change can make a difference. 
Some authors say that this is kind of like a placating band-aid solution. However, I found in the literature that the reduction or cessation of distress enhances learning and engagement, which is one key goal. Climate change action uh, is identified as a way to reduce feelings of anxiety throughout much of the literature, as taking an active stance can enhance feelings of hope and empowerment. However, messages of action meant to empower youth can overburden them if not delivered in a way that balances hope and threat, rejects pe pessimism, and shows progress. Refl reframing black and white thinking, uh, which is a common occurrence in young people, is also important for cultivating hope. Hope was identified by most authors as an antidote to pessimism driven apathy and eco anxiety itself. Um, only one proposed that hope is a placebo to make people feel better. Again, without hope, undertaking learning and engagement is extremely difficult. Media is often blamed for a lack of hope regarding climate change, uh, and it's common in the narratives of young people, and it may be connected to their age and sense of powerlessness that, that can come from their age, depending on their age group. Um, a lack of hope in young people. <clears throat> may also be the result of how adults around them talk about climate issues or perhaps the moral injury from witnessing governments and adults around them do nothing. Hope is important because it, it buffers existential worry and despair, reduces stress, and in turn allows for learning and climate change action. So my proposed definition of eco-anxiety, um, it's the experience is one of concern or worry of varying levels and primary primarily negative emotions concerning the natural world, human life, and uncertainty or fear about the future that may or may not be experienced as distress. Eco-anxiety may result in positive, neutral, or negative environmental behavior. Distress from eco-anxiety may, may be mild to severe and may be absent omnipresent or fluctuate, and it may manifest as anxiety disorder symptoms. Eco-anxiety is not anxiety related to natural disasters or climate change related weather events that could be defined as trauma responses. So this broad definition for eco-anxiety is suggested to help resolve the definition confusion, which can potentially add a layer of difficulty in addressing eco-anxiety in youth. Expanding the definition, in my mind, identifies that many young people with eco-anxiety may not actually need anxiety intervention and therefore broadens potential responses. However, identifying extreme levels of eco-anxiety distress may be unclear, uh, hence a scale is suggested. So uh, Hickman in 2020, uh, based on professional experience, places anxiety responses within a scale that they have been found to be helpful in practice and may work to help professionals identify young people in need of intervention. So mild to medium symptoms uh, can be summarized as having trust in others, feelings of upset that can be alleviated with distraction, distraction and reassurance, and anxiety that can be reduced by focusing on individual local action. There is little to mild disruption in cognition or thinking, no preoccupation by the climate crisis. Um, and then significant and severe eco-anxiety may be much more difficult to launch a defense against, and feelings include gr guilt, grief, fear, and little to no trust in others. Rumination on ecological crises may be apparent. There may also be significant lifestyle impacts, such as commitment to having no children, or severe disruptions, such as not paying bills or maintaining employment. Many activities may be seen as futile. This is only a summary uh, to illustrate how this framework in lieu of uh, clinical tools for professionals working with individuals and families may help conceptualize questions to determine if and how much suffering eco-anxiety is causing a young person. So the role of nurses has not yet been uh, really thoroughly explored at this point, but we can take an active stance on this. Nurses and other professionals must bring their awareness of eco-anxiety in this population since safety and security are really important foundations for mental health. This can be achieved through role modeling, connections to like-minded people, exploring opportunities for organized and individual action, such as active transport, or pardon me, joining an environmental action group. Challenging black and white thinking or hopeless narratives could also be a strategy to combat eco-anxiety, especially when young people may feel cynically feel individual or collective action is meaningless or too late to make a difference. Exposure to climate change messaging or activists that avoid a global doom narrative may be one way to address this. Um, and Hickman, again in 2020, noted, notes the importance of building emotional resilience in the face of eco-anxiety, which encompasses agency to address stressors, resources, positive self-esteem, and stable, secure links. 
They also discuss the importance of helping young people to live with uncertainty and insecurity and accept the varying emotions that they may go through as they experience eco-anxiety. It's really important to create space for validation, empathy, and understanding of these difficult and sometimes contradictory feelings while also normalizing them as a common experience. Um, that can help to build emotional resilience and create trust in young people that may have been dismissed, shunned, or judged for these feelings and experiences in the past. All of these strategies should be explored as potential strategies for nurses and other professionals to use to reduce the suffering of young people experiencing eco-anxiety and help guide them to well-being without pathologizing their experiences. So I just wanted to leave you with a quote that I found here. Um, young people are agents of change, our future leaders and most likely to succeed in improving planetary health. Thus, making investments to improve their mental health and well-being will provide dividends now and in the future. And thank you for listening. And uh, I can answer any questions in the chat or at the end of the presentations. And here are my references. Again, if anybody would like to read the full document, please feel free to send me an email at uh, Haley at ualberta.ca. Thank you. Thank you so much, Haley. So, Mika. <laughs> awesome. Uh, those are really amazing presentations, uh, Haley and Emily. I really um, learned a lot, so it was really excellent. So let me just make sure that you guys can see uh, my screen. Is it all good? Awesome. So I'll be talking a little bit about what we discussed around how taking action can help alleviate some of these feelings of eco-anxiety. And I'm going to be talking a little bit about how you could do that, how you could frame uh, your action as well. So let's jump in. So why take action? So tangible actions give us a sense of agency and control, even though the uh, ecological crises that we face in climate change aren't our responsibility. As um, Haley mentioned, it's not individual responsibility, but individual action can help. And us taking action does give us that sense that we can at least control, um, have agency control over our own impacts. Um, working on and focusing on solutions also brings us a sense of optimism and hope, which um, Haley mentioned was really uh, key, hope as an emotion to help us get through some of these challenges. And then lastly, making new connections, working on climate action also helps surround us with others who are doing this important work so we feel less alone in our emotions that we may be feeling. So to find out what specifically you should do when it comes to taking climate action, there's really three questions to ask yourself. Um, what brings you joy? What are you good at? And what is the work that needs doing? So to demonstrate this, there's actually this triple Venn diagram um, created by Dr. Ayanna Elizabeth Johnson, who's an ocean um, biology and, and scientist. And she really thinks that we should really focus on the intersection of these three areas. So for example, what brings us joy is activities and ideas and concepts maybe that are exciting to us, um, maybe activities that we enjoy doing, um, things that make us happy, right? Or things that give us hope. So really following what are those, maybe it's a movie you watched or a documentary or an article you read and some of the concepts in there really resonated with you. That's how you can find maybe one aspect of the climate crisis that um, the solutions for that bring you joy and then you can, you can tailor your focus there. The second aspect is what are you good at? So what are your skills, your network, your resources that you can use? So for, for Haley and Emily, um, they have great research skills, right? So they're able to use that to bring um, this important research forward and use their presentation skills as well to share what they've worked on, right? Maybe for you, you're good at um, other kinds of things. Maybe you're good at music and you want to communicate your emotions through song. Um, but thinking about the skills that you have 
or even the network that you've built from your studies, from your work that you can use as well. And then the third aspect is what is the work that needs doing? So when you look at, and especially for those of you that have maybe spent some time looking at the climate crisis, like what is, what is the work that maybe there's a gap, maybe that specific aspect isn't being addressed, right? If so in the case of this webinar, we realized there's a gap in climate anxiety in youth and thinking about solutions. So you can think about that as well of what do you think is the work that needs doing? And the intersection of all this is the work that you should do. So to give you an example for myself, um, I watched a documentary called Cowspiracy, which talked about the connection between our food system and climate change. And it, it made me realize that this is the work that needs doing because there wasn't a lot of focus on it. At the same time, it brought me joy to think about um, helping the world transition to more sustainable food systems that actually got me very excited. And then in terms of my skills, right, I'm good at, <clears throat> I'm good at writing so I could write articles. Um, I'm good at hosting events. So that was something that I did um, in, in terms of bringing these three different spheres together. So yeah, I would encourage everyone here to, to think about doing this exercise themselves as well. So now we'll talk a little bit about the different levels of climate action. So you can, you don't have to start at level one and go to level four. You can really look at these different levels and think about where it is that you want to start or, or which different levels you want to take action in, but it just really helps us frame how we can take action in different, in different ways and create impact in different ways because yeah, my climate action does have to look like your climate action and we can all do things in, in different ways as well. So when we talk about individual action, again, as Haley mentioned, um, it's not really our responsibility to fix all of this on our own. And we have to be careful not to put that burden on our shoulders, right? For a long time, I did feel that a lot myself that I need to put a lot of pressure on myself to fix this, but we can really start with smaller actions um, individually that can make an impact. And sometimes our individual action can actually inspire somebody else to make that action, right? For example, if you are riding your bike to work, maybe others at your workplace will be inspired by that. Or if you're eating a plant-based diet, others may be inspired by that as well and start doing the same thing. So these are some ideas. There's a great um, organization called Drawdown that basically looks at the different actions we need to take to draw down carbon over the next, um, by 2050. So you can actually look into that and look at the Drawdown Climate Solutions. And then these are some other ideas like reducing your food waste, changing your bank and pensions. So um, a lot of us aren't really aware, maybe, the bank that we're with is really invested in fossil fuels or invested in the things that are driving the climate crisis. So that's an idea of something you can do. And there's a lot of groups working on that called Banking for a Better Future, for example, that are working on the financial aspect, taking public transport, adopting a plant-based lifestyle, other solutions as well. So in terms of level two and three, this is taking action with your direct circles, your family and friends, as well as in your community. So these can include having conversations with your loved ones. There's a lot of resources online about how to talk about climate with um, the people around you and bring up these issues. You can share documentaries and resources among your friends. So there's a lot of great documentaries about the climate crisis that that show the urgency of the problem, but that also inspire hope. Um, so that's another good way of sharing these documentaries um, with others. You can ask your workplace to reduce their waste. So looking at where they can actually reduce waste and also in terms of the dining establishments shifting to plant-based. You can ask your apartment to start a composting program. I know that in the city of Toronto, most apartments do not have composting, so that's a big problem here. You can also ask your school or university to adopt sustainable practices. 
Now we get to level four, which is systemic action. So this is where we realize that the system as a whole is really what has created the world today. And so we need to actually change the way that our systems work to, to fix uh, the climate crisis. And when I talk about systems, I talk about our economic systems, our school systems, our banking systems, our food systems. So you can start by signing petitions. So there is a petition called the Fossil Fuel Treaty, which talks about non-proliferation of fossil fuels. There's also a plant-based treaty, which talks about transitioning our food systems. You can get involved with local and national climate groups. You can also attend events to learn about systems level change and what you can do like you're already doing today. Um, these are an exa some examples of organizations you can look into. Um, especially within Ontario that I found for you. So Youth Climate Save, that's a group that I'm involved with. The Ontario Climate Emergency Campaign has recently started here. Um, Leading Change focuses on really empowering young people to learn more about the climate crisis and become leaders in renewable energy. Toronto 350, Regeneration. Um, there's really a whole host of organizations. And once you do that activity where you find out what aspect of the climate crisis would you like to focus on or what brings you joy or what skills you have that will also help you find um, some organizations to get involved with. And you can also always connect with me and I can try to share some groups with you as well. And you can also get involved with the Canadian Association of Nurses for the Environment as well. So finally, remember to take care of yourself Self-care and surrounding yourself with things that bring you joy will make you more effective in your efforts and make you happier as well. So it can be really easy to get burnt out and try to join, you know, 10 different groups and try to go to every single event. And sometimes you might feel a little bit burnt out with this idea of all the action that you need to take. And I think that really comes from that feeling of responsibility and guilt so again, we have to remember that we're not alone in this fight and there are a lot of other, um, other people and other groups and other youth and other nurses that are taking action as well. So it's not all on you to do everything. So remember to take care of yourself. So that's all for me. You can connect with me on LinkedIn, on Instagram, at Youth Climate Safe Canada. Um, and that's our website as well. So I will pass it back to uh, the hosts. Well, thank you so much to all three of you for a really uh, wonderful session. I think just really helping everybody to understand, certainly helping me um, to understand these different concepts as well too, because I think we hear the, the words a lot, uh, so nostalgia, eco-anxiety, et cetera, without necessarily being able to differentiate between uh, how they are distinguished one from the other as well too. So I think that's very helpful, but also thinking about um, addressing eco-anxiety in ourselves as well too, and, and what we might do to, to be able to cope with that. And, and I, I think I really appreciate as well too the, the different levels of uh, action that you mentioned as well too, uh, Nika, too, from individual right up to systemic uh, action as well too. And I think especially because sometimes people, you know, tend to, sometimes you hear that, well, individual action doesn't really, you know, make a difference, but I think it's, it, it's, it's great to underline that that also is very important as well too. And, and that it's not up to you to solve the whole crisis yourself. <laughs> as well too but um so i think those are thank you very much for those really wonderful presentations um and uh i guess maybe uh while people might be thinking about some questions or comments they might have um maybe i would ask i have a, there's a couple of questions here and um one is uh, have you each of you maybe have you experienced climate anxiety yourselves and um, what has it felt like for you and um what what is it that gives each of you hope so maybe just a, a each of you might be able to respond to that question yes absolutely and thank you for the question fiona um i'd like to say that I've definitely had the feelings of eco-anxiety or I like to more associate with ecological grief, uh, particularly in the sense of 
thinking, hey, will I ever have children one day? Or if, if that's the best choice or buying a house on certain lands or in certain cities because they're more at risk of being hit by natural disasters or um, there's more pollution. So those are um, day-to-day -day thoughts that I have. Um, things that have given me hope. So there is hope is, you know, before I found maybe 10 years ago, we were in the worst possible case scenario, of like that seven degree warming. And now we're getting closer to the four to three, still not ideal, but better than the seven to eight degrees. And I, what gives me hope as well is my activism, what I do through my research and what I'm doing with my PhD at the moment. So that's kind of what helps me in the day by day. Great, thank you for that wonderful answer, Haley. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, the reason that I took on this um, topic in the first place was because of my own eco emotions for sure. Um, and I especially worry about the the youth that I work with and um, the you know younger nurses that are coming up that are gonna have to deal with a lot of these climate issues. Again, I and I talked about this a little bit, like we're the global north, we are a in a highly privileged position. We're not going to see a lot of this, but you know, we are going to be serving communities and we're if we're, you know, we're gonna be more aware of what's going on in the world. So it's it's going to be um you know, something that we're going to have to deal with. So yeah, um, for myself, uh, there's a, like, there's lots of stuff that I've done and changed in my lifestyle to cope with the eco anxiety. And sometimes it can be overwhelming, but like Emily, um, you know, using my knowledge and education and, um, you know, uh, getting active in, in my local community as well. It certainly helps me, but it's something that I think that I still have a hard time talking to other nurses about. Um, I think that's my challenge right now. Yeah. Well, thank you, Nika. You're nodding. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, but those are great points and uh, it can be a challenge, right? Talking to other people, whether with our profession or just in the broader community. Um, so for me, yeah, I feel eco-anxiety when I think about that intergenerational aspect that Emily uh, touched on in terms of what about the next generation even after me, like when I have kids, um, how will that impact them? You know, will they have an Amazon rainforest to see? Will they have access to green space and things like that? Um, that definitely gives me some anxiety. And then in terms of actually one of the emotions mentioned uh, was anger, <clears throat> sorry, which I do feel sometimes because I look at the incrementalism in action where we're just, you know, trying to improve just one step at a time. And sometimes we need more than that. We're really in an emergency. And when I see that lack of emergency level action, it does make me angry sometimes. Um, but what I do to fight that, so in Ontario, we have this Ontario Climate Emergency Campaign, and they did have an event in person um, this past weekend, and that did give me a lot of hope because I saw young people and old people and all kinds of people there uh, really gathering under this one cause of the fact that climate really needs to become an issue for the election and going forward. So. What really makes me hopeful is, is being in community and surrounding myself with people. And one of the things that we did was we had a group called Music for Climate Justice performing and actually just listening to the music and everyone singing together was a very uniting and hopeful moment. So I think that is what gives me hope is being able to surround myself with people that are feeling these emotions as well, but that are trying to take action and being surrounded by them. Thank you. That's, I think that's one of the things that I, I was very interested to see in your list of uh, different groups that music declares the emergency uh, climate action, I guess, or climate, they're declaring a climate emergency as well too. So I guess that's also hopeful that you're seeing different sectors from you know uh the arts community as well too who are um who are also very aware of the climate emergency and and doing something in their in their milieu to be able to address it i think that's also certainly that that gives me hope 
too that uh, that you see these these different movements coming across all different kinds of sectors of society. Um, maybe another question would be um, that I, I see is is a, a question about um, nurses. So this is more I guess this would be more to uh, Emily and to Haley as well too. That how do how do nurses um, manage? How would they manage to fit in um, addressing these issues? with everything else, you know, as well as managing their own eco anxiety and the busyness of their lives uh, and their work. How, how, how do nurses uh, broach the topic in their workplaces? I don't know whether either of you or any of you <laughs> um, might, might be able to respond to that. Um, I can just touch on, you know, I don't know how each and every one of the nurses will do it, I can just touch on what I can do and why we should do it. Um, the environment is directly linked to the health of humans. And as nurses are one of our um, preoccupations is maintaining or improving the health of our patients and the people of our community. So uh, just to think of that is why it should engage nurses to do so. Um, I think a lot of nurses might not recognize or acknowledge at what point the environment is impacting us because a lot of the times when you're working in a clinic or in a hospital setting, you know, you see an environment as a patient hospital room. So you're not maybe looking at a forest fire happening, I don't know, 3000 kilometers away. How is that impacting my patient right here, right now in front of me? But sometimes we might need to step back a little more and look at the systematic issue and not just um, what's happening in front of me right now because then we'll be missing the bigger picture. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good point, Emily. I think um, it's also important to remember that healthcare specifically, as they're major, major producers of waste and uh, carbon emissions. Um, so it doesn't, like nurses are not expected at the ground level as an individual to, go out and change, make systemic change. Uh, that's, that's not possible for any issue. Um, you know, it, it requires, like I said, collective action is really important. In terms of my topic, um, addressing youth eco-anxiety, just getting awareness out there and talking about it and starting to ask those questions if you do work with youth, or even if you don't work with youth, if you work with people who maybe are a little bit more anxious or you hear, I don't know, it's, now that I've become more aware of what uh, this is, this topic of eco anxiety, I can start. I can can start to kind of hear it in people's everyday speech. Um, you know, people talking about, well, you know, we're not going to use plastic today, or oh, let, don't throw that styrofoam thing out. Let's recycle that. And you know, it just it just is a little bit. It sparks some curiosity, I guess. Um, so if you can take that spark of curiosity and follow that thread and see, maybe your patients are thinking about this kind of thing. Maybe they're worried about it. Um, maybe you are not alone in your curiosity about what we can do uh, to reduce the emissions of hospitals or workplaces. Um, I think it was uh, Emily that talked about a reduction in waste, or maybe that was Nikia. Sorry, it's <laughs> mixing the two, um, two groups up. But uh, yeah, just taking any kind of small action is good is, is good as well, right? Um, and yeah, it is it is difficult. So making it a priority, I think is important, but at the same time, being realistic with your time and energy. Well, thank you for those uh, responses. Um, I don't know whether other people have any questions. Um, Pauline is saying uh, thank you very much for the informative uh, presentations. Um, if anybody has a question and would like to uh, turn on the camera possibly and ask a question live, of course, you're very welcome to do so um, in the remaining few minutes that we have of uh, today. Maybe a question uh, in the meantime as well too would be, um, you know, do you yourself see in the, in the young people around you that um, 
you know, because we've talked a lot about the, the research of on, on eco-anxiety and some of the surveys that have been done or uh, the, about the, the youth uh, of, you know, across different uh, sectors of, of the age level of the population feeling eco-grief or eco-anxiety. Um, but do you, do you see that this, it, it comes up in, in a conversation with the young people around you, um, in, you know, in the way that they talk or, or the way that they, they are? Does, does, is it a topic that you see that comes up in, in the young people around you, would you say? And sometimes it can be the avoidance of the topic as well. Like if they shut down any kind of talk about the environment or loss of animals or nature or anything, that you can see it in there as well. Even uh, maybe if people want to answer in the chat, yes or no, if they've seen that in their practice or even in just their, uh, their lives. I'm just going to add to that 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 feeling of guilt we mentioned comes up sometimes. Like I'll mention that I've been doing this work for the environment to someone that's not as involved and they'll say, well, I should really be doing something or, you know, I, I really should do something. But I think it's that kind of paralyzation of not really knowing what to do or thinking that they won't be able to make an impact or they're already facing so many other issues. You know, youth today, struggle with even just paying rent and food prices are going up and <laughs> trying to figure out their careers and graduate in the midst of a pandemic. And I think there's just so many different pressures on youth as well at the same time to ask them as well to take action for climate. But I think that guilt is there and they do want to do something about it, but maybe just a lack of awareness. And so I think for those of us that are aware, maybe it's whenever not responsibilities, but one of our actions we can take is sharing resources or sharing events or doing what we can to try to bring people into the conversation. Thanks. Robin, did you have uh, something that you wanted to ask or something to say? I, I just wanted to say thank you to Haley, Emily, and Nika. Um, so I'm brand new to Kane, so I've missed the previous workshop series. Um, but uh, I work with, uh, I'm a new teacher with college students. And I mean, one of the issues is that our students have a lot of anxiety already on just so many other spheres of their life at the age of 17, 18, 19. So, um, a lot of teachers become hesitant about how to bring this up, how to breach this, but I really appreciated sort of the, um, the very uh, positive uh, uh, way you're presenting this and uh, just the way you're, the, it's, it's, a, it's a great mindset for teachers to adopt as well as we try to bring this up with uh, younger students. Um, so yeah, thank you. <laughs> and I, I really appreciated how you acknowledge that, I mean, in general, we learn about the ecological, um, you know, emergency through mass media that has a very negative uh, producing spin. I mean, the anxiety is, uh, it's very catchy. It's, and that's how we're normally exposed to these messages. So we have to find a way of countering that type of messaging. Yeah, I think I, I really hear you, Robin, as well too, as, a, as a, also a teacher myself as well too. And, and hearing this, I think students coming to our classes now who, um, who are conscious of this in, in their lives in some way as well too. And, and the importance I think of just even opening the conversation and acknowledging that this is, is part of the reality of their lives, as, as, especially in you know, our, our world of, of nursing education, I think as well too, that it's an added layer of anxiety on top of the stress of being a nursing student and all that that entails, uh, you know, with the emotional and intellectual stresses of, of that as well, too. But on, on top of that, thinking about their their future um, and so being able to to at least open the dialogue and discuss it or allow them to, to talk about uh, these uh, these things on their minds as well, too. And yeah, absolutely. I think having this positive spin that I think really the messages of hope that you have given as well, too, that hope really does, I think, like Greta herself, you know, Greta Thunberg had, had very much, uh, that's very much her message as well too, that hope does come from action, but the action has to be there um, yeah, from uh, uh, at different levels. I, I don't know if anybody has any final comments or questions uh, before we close uh, our session for, for today.
Well, in that case, I'll thank you then to each of you very much for, for this really excellent presentation. And I think for combining, you know, giving us a really three-dimensional or four-dimensional um, insight into this issue as well, too. And uh, the wonderful collaboration uh, as well, too, with, uh, you know, within our, our nursing world, having Nika Yu here as well is, is something very, very special as well, too. And um, so thank you for all of the work that each of you are doing in, in your respective fields as well, too. That's really very important as well. And um, yes, and I invite everybody to, uh, to be in touch with the speakers, as they mentioned, if they would like to have a follow up from them or any, any materials shared or groups that they would like to be, uh, to be in contact with or to know about. Thank you very much.